right. Oh, this is far too loud. Better. Okay. Welcome back. So, today we're going to. It's our last lecture on object oriented programming. After that point, we're going to move on. And then on Monday, we're going to start talking about data structures and algorithms, and that's what's going to consume us for the rest of the semester. And along the way, we will have a chance to continue to introduce a few new ideas in object-oriented programming. We're going to talk a little bit about generics, which is something that um, is useful once we talk about sort of uh, generic ways to store data in Java. Um, and we'll also get a practice to strengthen our abilities to solve problems using computer programming. We're going to talk about a new technique called recursion that allows us to solve a new category of problems that have certain features. But today, it's time to finish up interfaces. So this is, you know, again, this is one of the things that I'm, I'm really happy that we talk about in this class because it's a really powerful concept. It is new to many of you, um, probably to all of you. And so we'll spend a little time just reviewing, and this is a good chance to take some questions and make sure that we sort of have some degree of a solidified understanding of, of what an interface is and how powerful it is. We'll actually do a couple examples today in class as well, showing you both the user side of an interface, how to use an interface to solve a problem, and the provider side, how to have your class provide an interface so that something good can then be done with it. Okay, so as a review, an interface is this place where two pieces of software come together. And what we're seeing, we're sort of having you guys on the homework problems jump back and forth between the two sides of the interface. Um, sometimes we think about the code that implements a particular function as providing that interface, or the functions that are part of the interface. I have a class that provides it, and then I have another class that uses it. And there's been some natural confusion about this. You guys have homework problems. That's good. That's, that's what we're aiming for. We want you guys to have to think about both, you know, with something like compare to, how do I implement it so that my class is now comparable, and then also how do I use it, right? So you're, those two tasks are on two sides of this interface. Um, and, you know, the interface is, can be, interfaces in computer science are a very broad idea, and they can be um, between all sorts of different types of parts of a system. Right? Two parts that are software, two parts where one of them is hardware, another is software, two pieces of hardware, um, et cetera. So there's lots of different places in a computer system where we have an interface between two parts. And interfaces allow us to build bigger systems in a well-structured way. And that's something that's hard to get across when you guys are doing these small problems, but I'm going to try to sort of drive home today. This idea that an interface really allows me to start thinking about how I can build a much bigger system. Because at a well-defined interface with good documentation, I've created a place where two pieces of my system can come together, but they don't have to know a lot about each other. Uh, the code on one side of an interface doesn't have to understand what happens on the other side, and vice versa. So a provider of an interface doesn't have to worry about how the interface gets used, a user of an interface doesn't have to worry about exactly how each class provides that, as long as they stick to the specification that defines what that interface is supposed to do. So that's incredibly important. Java has a built-in idea of interfaces as part of the language, and we've started to see how to use them. So here's an example of one that contains a single function. Interfaces can define variables, but you really tend to use them to define methods to define one or more methods, and then to indicate how those methods are supposed to work, what they're supposed to do at a semantic level, not at a level of code. This function thing that looks like a function declaration does not tell you how to add those two numbers together. Now, again, this is a silly example because there's really only one way to add two numbers, but when we start talking about comparable, which you guys have been working with, that is something that we want to allow to happen on a class-specific basis. So we want to say, here's what it means for a class to be comparable. If your class can be compared with other classes, and not every class can, you can implement this interface to tell the rest of the Java code that surrounds you that, hey, there's a meaningful order between objects of this class. Then I can use that to do all sorts of cool stuff, one of the things we'll talk about later. Okay. Okay. 
So job interfaces look like empty object methods because really that's what they are. They're just telling you, here are the methods you have to implement. And then I need a lot of documentation there to tell you exactly how to do it because that's part of an interface. If I just put up a Java interface definition without any explanation, it's impossible for you to do it right. This is one place where we have to have documentation. Okay. Right, so now if I decide that my class wants to implement a particular interface, I do that by declaring, when I declare my class, that it implements that interface, and then I have to implement the methods that the interface includes. So I'm gonna say my class is capable of adding two numbers, and here's how I do it. Now again, silly example, only one way to add two numbers, um, but useful when we're just getting started. Okay. So, and in order to implement an interface, I have to implement all of the methods that it declares with the proper type signatures. If I don't do that, the compiler will generate an error for you because it'll say, hey, you told me you were gonna implement the add interface, but you forgot to implement a function called add that takes two integer arguments. Now, one thing I wanna make very clear here, right, is that the compiler and Java in general has no idea what an interface is supposed to mean at a, at a high level. So when we talk about comparable, Java doesn't understand whether or not you've implemented comparable correctly. It's possible that you implemented it wrong. There's no way for the compiler to tell. So the meaning of an interface, to the compiler, the meaning of an interface is that simply you've implemented these methods. But the meaning of an interface in order to really have it work properly is bound up in the documentation, in the specification. I can implement compare to incorrectly, and the compiler won't care. It'll just say, okay, you have a method called you know, compare to that returns the right type and takes the right type, I'm good. But then when you try to use that to do useful stuff, it's gonna fail. Because the compiler can't tell whether or not you've implemented compare to in the right way. All it can do is check to make sure that if you declare that you're gonna implement an interface, your class contains the right methods. There's no way of figuring out whether those methods do the right thing. Maybe in your lifetime, I certainly think that you're gonna see a lot more work in compilers and in runtime systems that use the English or whatever language text that is documentation to try to help you. We're not there yet, so maybe 10 years from now, when you compile your code, the compiler will say, hey, the documentation for compare to says to do this, but I don't think that's what you're doing. But so far, we can't do that. That's still an open problem, is figuring out how to take an English language description or a human language description of a function and figure out whether or not it matches the code yet. The com computers can't quite do that yet, but they're getting better at things like this. And so I think within your lifetimes, you're gonna see more of this. Okay, so, you know, so again, just to drive that point home, if my add or class wants to implement add, I can certainly do this. I can say public int add, int first, int second, return first minus second. I can do that, that's wrong. But the, the, the compiler doesn't know that, this will run. So again, there's no way for the compiler, and, and frequently even for a test suite to know what, whether or not you've implemented an interface properly. All it knows is that you've declared the methods with the right signatures and they return the right thing. So the fact that I'm actually implementing subtract here is completely lost on this code, and there's really no way for it to tell that. Okay, we talked about the fact that just like polymorphism, where I can take an object and I can upcast it to a reference variable that stores either the object itself or one of its parents, I can do the same thing with an interface. So here on line 12, I have a reference variable called add, of type interface. This is a reference variable with an interface type. This reference variable stores a reference to some object that implements add. That can be any object that implements add. Here on the right side, I'm creating an adder, and I've declared that my adder implements add. So, so I'm okay. Um, once I have a reference variable that, re that refers to an interface, however, I can only use the methods defined in that interface. So I can't call multiply here, despite the fact that adder implements multiply. Because the only methods I can call are the ones that are implemented 
uh, as part of the ad interface. All right, so here's why, right? Let me, let me try to drive this home with another example. So here I've got a public interface ad, I've got a public class called adder. Let me create another adder and also have that implement add. And I'm just gonna borrow the same code from here, up here. So now I've got two classes that implement the add interface. This is typically, it's very rare, if not unheard of, to create an interface to only have one class implement it. Usually when I declare an interface, I want it to be implemented by multiple classes because it represents some piece of useful functionality that multiple classes can provide. And again, when we talk about comparable, you'll see how this works. But here now, in my little simple example, I have two classes that implement add. Um, and so, on the right side of my assignment here, where the left side is a reference variable of type add, I can either use an adder or another adder or any object that implements add. And this is why I can't call multiply. Because the only thing that's guaranteed here is that both of these classes implement this add method. Another adder doesn't implement multiply. Adder implements multiply. So now this works, and if I switch this out to be adder, this still works, they do the same thing. Two different types of objects, but the compiler can check to make sure that they both implement add, the add interface correctly, and so my add interface reference type can guarantee that it can call an add method on both objects. Questions about this, because this you will see going forward. Yeah. Well, I'll say, so the question is, if they return different things, okay, so let's see what happens here, right? So now I've got adder returning the two plus one, and another adder returning the sum. So the implementation that's being used is defined by the class that's on the right side. The interface cast guarantees that I can call this add method. It's a great question. One of the things we're gonna start doing next week, and one of the reasons that we're talking about interfaces is we're gonna start talking about trade-offs when we start to build various types of data structures. So just as a little preview, next week we'll start talking about a data structure called a list. A list is a fantastic data structure. It's essentially a generalization of an array, but I can add items to it. So I can insert items in the middle, I can add items at the end, I can add items at the beginning. So it's like a more flexible array that can change size and where I can also insert things into it. So that's awesome, right? It turns out that there are multiple ways to implement a list. They have different trade-offs. We're gonna talk about several of those ways and we'll talk about the trade-offs involved. But the cool thing is, they both behave the same way. And we can, in, we can sort of capture that by having them both implement a list interface. So we're gonna talk about a list interface next week, and then we'll talk about two different implementations of that list interface. So from the perspective of the code that's using the list, they behave the same way. They can do the same things. Underneath the covers, they're very different because they're implemented differently, and they have different trade-offs. There's no winner. Um, you can implement a list using an array to store the items. That implementation has certain properties that make it good for certain things and not good for other things. You can implement a list by linking items together into something called a linked list. That implementation is good for some things and bad for others. So it depends on how you're going to use the list, but both of them behave in the same way. They can both, they both allow me to do the same things, right? So this is one of the things we're gonna do next week. Different implementations, the same interface. Other questions? Good, that was a good question. Okay, so. So we talked a little bit about, you know, the similarities here between interfaces and, and, um, and inheritance, right? Interfaces seemed a lot like what I do when I just inherit from, from a, another class, right? Um, interface is sort of like the parent class, implements is, is sort of like extends, and um, essentially providing your own implementation is like overriding the parent, right? Um, some of the, and, and there's this way to do this in Java using abstract classes. So if I declare a class as abstract, and I declare a method as abstract, you'll see here that there's no body for an abstract method. This acts very, very similarly to an interface. So if you extend add, you have to provide an implementation of the abstract method. You can't inherit it because it doesn't exist. 
and punted on this. They were like, you know what, if you want to extend me, you got to implement this method. I don't know how to do it, but I'll leave it up to you. Um, but you, um, you can't inherit the add implementation of the add function because it doesn't exist. It's marked as abstract. So again, the, there's, there's a very, there's, there's sort of an existing mechanism in Java that provides us some of the same features, but the reason that we use interfaces is partly because we want to allow classes in different parts of the tree to display the same type of behavior. So, for example, if I only use inheritance, depending on what class I have to inherit from, I have to, so for example, we think about comparable, right? I might say that, you know, all objects are not comparable. We'll talk about that a little bit later, right? This is a feature that only some objects have. But there's no natural place in the object hierarchy to put the comparable, um, to, to start forcing objects to be comparable. There's no one branch of the object tree where every item is comparable and another branch where they're all not comparable. It turns out that if you look at the Java type hierarchy, you've got some comparable objects here and some there, and which objects are comparable really doesn't have anything to do with where they are in the tree. It has to do with whether or not there's a natural order aid for those objects, which we'll talk about again in a second. And I can also implement multiple interfaces. So this is another bit of flexibility that I have that through interfaces rather than inheritance. So rather than being stuck in one branch of the tree and only having one parent, I can implement multiple interfaces. Um, and there are very good use cases for this. Okay. I'm just going to skip this example today. We've already done that. All right. So, and, and here's, let me back up a little bit and talk about, again, interfaces in general. So the thing that makes interfaces work is not their um, implementation in any particular programming language, because there are programming languages that don't provide any sort of formal support in the language for an interface. So for example, JavaScript doesn't have an interface keyword. There's no way to um, have the compiler or the runtime system check your interfaces for you. So you've got some languages that support interfaces natively and others that don't, but interfaces exist everywhere in software and in computer science. And the reason really is, is about interfaces as a contract between, or an agreement between the provider and the user of the interface. That agreement is bound up in the text that accompanies the interface. So if you look up the official Java documentation for Comparable, for example, which is a real Java interface, you'll find a long explanation of exactly what it's supposed to do. That is critical. That really is the interface, is the text. Because there are arbitrary decisions that get made when you, when you design interfaces, and everybody has to agree on how stuff's going to work, right? So essentially, the provider of the interface says, I'm going to read the interface, and I'm going, to, I'm going to implement the methods that it requires in the way that it is described in the documentation. If I don't do that, I've got no guarantees about what's going to happen. The user of the interface says, I'm going to assume that when I get a class that implements a particular interface, it works as defined in the documentation. And I'll use that to do cool stuff. Now, the user and the provider of the interface are frequently two different pieces of code. And the cool thing is that those two people that are designing part one and part two never have to communicate with each other. A lot of times they don't even know who the other person is. The reason for this is that there's an agreement in place about how things are going to happen. That agreement is the interface documentation or the interface contract. So if, you know, you can imagine, like, if I, we'll, we'll show this in a little, a bit, little bit, right? Um, where instead of, like, the two software developers talking to each other about how their classes are going to interact, the person who's providing the interface reads the description about how it's supposed to work, and the person who's using it reads the description about how it's supposed to work. And without any additional collaboration, communication, or even acknowledgement of each other, we can have really cool things that just work. Right, so that's really neat about interface. And so the interface contract has to be, again, very specific about how things are supposed to work. If it's not, you have ambiguity, people make different decisions, and you have uh, undesirable behavior. Right? So we have to be very specific about what we have to agree on in order for things to work correctly. 
All right. So let's talk about comparable, which you guys have been working with on the homework. So here's how this works for comparable. If you choose to implement comparable on your class, you do not have to. This is a choice. If you choose to implement comparable, you are stating the following. First, there is an order between two objects of your class. That is not always true. There are objects in the world, and there are objects that you're going to model in your code that don't have a natural ordering. If, they, if, 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 you, if there's no natural way to order two instances of your object, don't implement comparable, because you can't compare them. Comparable means my class can be compared with another instance of the same class in a meaningful way. So you can think about it. If, if Java hands you two instances of your class, you have to say, this one goes first, and this one goes second. Now, sometimes it's a tie. You can say these, these two you know, are equivalent to each other as far as an ordering is concerned. But you have to make that decision. And you have to make it in a consistent way. You could say, oh, I'll just randomly you know, uh, put one before the other. But it has to be a consistent way to do this. There has to be a principle that you're using to put one in front of the other. Some property of your class that means that one object goes in front of another. So for example, maybe your class represents something about time. And a natural ordering is to put objects in order by when they happen. Objects that happen earlier go earlier. Objects that happen later go later. So if I give you two objects, you look at that timestamp and you say, whichever one is earlier goes first, and the later one goes second. That's an example of a natural ordering. Now, if you do this, so that's the provider side. You have to not only declare that your class has an ordering, but you have to show me. You have to show Java how to do that. By implementing compare to, you are running a function that answers that question, which one goes first. Once you do that for me, I can do the following things. I can sort. If you give me a big array of objects of your type, I can sort them from smallest to largest, using this order that you provided me. So that's kind of cool. Right? Sorting, we will talk about later in the class, turns out to be tremendously useful as a primitive. With some more useful algorithms out there, we'll talk about a bunch of different ways to do it and the fun trade-offs involved. But I can do this if you can compare two objects. If you can't compare two objects, there's no way to sort them, right? It's meaningless. You know, I just have an array of objects, and there's no right way to put them in order. OK. I can also find things like a minimum value. If you give me a bunch, I can find the minimum. Again, we'll do this in a few, maybe at the end of lecture today. Right? You guys are working on this today as a homework problem. All I need to be able to do to find a minimum is to compare two objects together. When you guys, you guys wrote code to do this already. When you did that, we were using numbers. We were using primitive types like int. So you compared one int to another int just using the greater than or less than operator. Compare to is sort of like the same thing. You can think of compare to as a generalization of greater than, equals, or less than. Right? But it works for objects, not just numbers. Okay? So now I can essentially take the same code that you wrote to find a minimum or maximum value over an array of integers, and with some small modifications, it can now find the minimum or maximum value of any comparable object, of an array of any kind of comparable object. So that's very cool. Suddenly, all the comparable out there, objects out there in the world, you can find the minimum of, any of them. I can also arrange your classes into more complicated data structures, like something called a binary tree. So there's, a, there's something called a binary tree, where the position of where I put the object in the tree depends on how it compares to other objects. So I have to be able to compare things in order to do this. So again, provider is up here. You commit to being able to compare two instances of your class. That's the provider side. The user is all this stuff at the bottom. And the cool thing about Java is that there's already a bunch of code that does this. You guys don't have to write sort. You guys don't have to write minimum. There are libraries all, are, are already out there in Java that will do this for you. But if you want them to work on your class, they need help from you. They need you to tell them how to compare two instances of that class. 
But we talked, we talked a little bit before about an interface is also a barrier, right? Ideally, when I set up a good interface, I can have independent development on both sides of that interface. So I can have new classes that implement comparable, and I can have new algorithms that use comparable. And those two pieces of development don't have to have anything to do with each other, as long as we have an agreement about what it means for two things to be able to be compared. So again, this is another one of the reasons that we use software interfaces, right? It breaks down our problem into smaller pieces. When you guys go out and work in industry, or even if you work on a large research project with a lot of moving parts, what you're gonna find is that one of the, you know, so if you think about like how do you, how, how do people work on a huge software project like Chrome or Microsoft Windows or, you know, whatever? How does that happen? There are millions of lines of code that are part of these systems. They're incredibly complicated. Do you think there's anybody that knows how the whole thing works? Usually there's like three people, right? Um, I, uh, I, I worked as, a, as an intern at Microsoft years and years ago, and the group that I was working on was working in a particular area of, of trying to you know, add something to the Microsoft Windows operating system. And there were thousands of people, and still are thousands of people, that work on Microsoft Windows. But there are like three of them that have been there for a long time, at least at the time there were. Who knows what it's like now? But at the time, there were three of them that essentially owned a huge piece of the project. So there was one guy, and this is operating system stuff you guys aren't expected to understand, there was one guy who like owned all the VM code, and there was another guy who owned all of the uh, process support, and there was another guy who owned all the file system code. And then there were hundreds and hundreds of other people working on those projects. But when those uh, lead developers made a decision, it was over, right? I was in a meeting once, and people were talking about like, should we do this or should we do that? And then like 35 minutes late, the guy who owned that part of the project walked in, and they were like, should we do this? And he was like, no. And they were like, okay then, we won't do it, right? And he left like five minutes later, right? So, um, but in general, the way that these projects work is that, you know, even if there's an overseer of a large piece of the project, there's still a lot of internal agreement about how things are gonna work. So one team is working on part of the system, and there's an interface to what they do. And so as long as they implement the interface, Everybody else can work, and they can assume that their part of the system is going to interact properly with the other parts, right? So interfaces allow me to break up the development of a large product into much, much smaller pieces that can then proceed independently of each other. Okay, so let's do a couple of these problems as practice, right? I am well aware of the fact you guys have a quiz coming up on interfaces this weekend, which will happen before we meet again, so let's, let's do a little bit of review. So... This was a problem on providing interfaces. We're gonna do two problems. We're gonna do one on providing, we're gonna do one on using. All right, so this problem asks you to create a class called string length that implemented a version of the comparable interface. And I will point out that that version is different than the official version, which you guys will have a chance to work with later. So string length essentially stores a string internally. Um, to provide a constructor that takes that string so I can create one given a string. But the difference is that, str so string, strings can be compared. We'll use that later. But when you compare two strings in Java, you get a lexicographic comparison. It's based on where they are in the dictionary. That's one example of a natural order, right? Um, we've all agreed that within a particular language, certain words go in a certain order. That what, that's what allows something like a dictionary to work. If there was no natural order of words that we had agreed on, imagine trying to find a word in a dictionary. It would take you, you know, years. So string length is supposed to uh, implement comparable for the underlying string, but we're gonna do it a little bit differently. We're gonna do it based on the length. And so here's what we told you to do. Um, compare to should return the following. It should return at negative one if other is less than the specified object. Here, it should, that means that the length of the string inside other is less than the length of my string. And it should also return null in a couple of other special cases. If I don't, if the thing that's passed is either null or not an instance of string length. If the two are equal, meaning the two strings have the same length, I should return zero. And if the other string is longer than my string, I should return one. Now again, I wanna point something out. This was semi-intentional. 
the official comparable documentation is backwards. Well, I should say we're backwards, because it is correct, right? Um, in the official comparable documentation, I would return one for the first case and negative one for the last case. Why? Because this is just a convention. There's no law of the universe that says how this is supposed to work, but there is a very specific piece of documentation. So for example, if you goofed up and implemented compare to incorrectly, um, your objects would not, things would not work the way that you think they should, right? If I sort your array, and I, if you've asked me to sort your array from descending from the smallest item to the greatest item, what you would get back is an array sorted from the greatest item to the smallest item, which is not what you want. Okay, so a, a, a little note on the importance of reading the documentation. All right, so I've got my comparable interface here, sort of just as a, as a uh, reminder. And now let's, let's implement our string length class. So I need a constructor. And that constructor should wrap a string. I will have my, I need to store a reference to that string. Um, no, sorry, let me do this. Okay, so I've got a structure that's gonna set the, my string, okay? So I, I, now I can create instances of string length. Great. All right, so now let's, let's go through and work on this. So I've gotta implement compare to. I need the right signature, so public int compare to object other. So compare to takes an object reference. So if other is null, that's one thing I wanted to check. Um, or, so if I've got a null reference passed to this, or it's not an instance of str a string length, what should I do? Documentation here says to return negative one. All right, so let's get that out of the way. The reason we want to get that out of the way first is because we need to downcast our object reference to a string length so that we can access its, the string that's inside of it. And I can't do that if I have something that's not a string length object. So now I'm gonna say string length other as string length is equal to string length other. So now I'm doing my downcast. I know this is safe because if it wasn't an instance of string length, I've already returned. So if I get to this point, I know that I have something that's not null and not an instance of string length. Now I'm at the point where I've got my own variables and I've got the other variables, and now I just have to kind of uh, check the lengths properly. So I'm gonna say if other as string length dot contents dot length is greater than contents.length. Note here that I can do this. Why can I access the private field of this variable? Because I'm in a method defined on the class. So that's actually kind of nice in Java. Um, even, if the, um, the, the, even if I have a reference to another string length object, I can still access its private fields inside a method defined on that class. So I don't have to write a setter or a getter here, which is kind of, kind of nice. So that's one of my cases. I also have a case where it's less than to handle. Oop, don't do that. Okay, so I've got less, and then if I get here, oh, I need an else if, not an else. If I get here, I know they're the same. So if I, if I drop into this else statement, I know that the two must be equal. Now here is where I have to go back and, and be careful and look at the documentation if other is less than the specified object. So that's this case right here. So if other string length dot contents dot length is less than my length, I'm gonna return negative one, and that means that in my first bracket I should return one. That's it. This is a pretty common pattern for implementing an, uh, an interface like this that, that takes an object reference in particular, right? So you gotta check for null, make sure that the object is, is what I need it to be. Um, I do that first, then I do a downcast, and now I can investigate the properties of that object in ways that are uh, appropriate to the problem, right? So let's say, um, 
create a string length reference. Well, let's use like one, and let's do, so let's say first dot compare, like I want to print this. First, compare to, let's try null, make sure that works, okay. Let's try a string, okay, a, a string is not a string length, right, so that should also fail, right? it's going to come through that, that first uh, if statement. Now let's try using some string length instances. So let's do string length two. That should return zero. They have the same number of letters. Okay, let's try something with like an empty string. Okay, so, so now, uh, this, is, this is very, you know, we have to be careful here. If other is less than the specified object. Okay, so the object I'm calling compare to on is first. First has a length of three. The object that is other here is the new string length that I'm creating inside the call to compare to. That has length zero. So is zero less than three? Yes, right, so negative one is correct. Now let's try taking something that's longer. Now I have one. Questions about this before we go on? So, so and again, this is the pattern for implementing compare to, right? Do some defensive stuff at the top, to make sure that you don't have a null reference, you have the reference of the right type, and then what comes after that is really up to you. In this case, my string length object compares to other string length objects based on the length. But I could do this in a lot of different ways, right? As long as I'm consistent, right? There needs to be a natural ordering of these. Um, I don't just want to retur randomly return zero, one, or negative one. That will cause a lot of things that rely on this to, to fail. Okay, good. And so again, I didn't have to write much code there, right? That wasn't that much work, did that in a couple minutes. But by doing this, I have unlocked this huge world of other code that's out there in the world. You can find this, like Java has a bunch of different methods and different types of existing code that needs your class to be comparable to work. But once you do that small amount of work there, all of those things are now unlocked. So this is kind of magical. I do a little bit of work to tell you how to compare it to objects in my class, and then suddenly there's all this new thing, all this new stuff that Java can do with your class because you've told it how to put things in order. So again, I can sort things, I can search for stuff in an efficient way, um, and this is something that we're going to come back to. One of the reasons we talk about comparable now is we're going to use it when we do sorting, right, algorithms, when we do search, when we do trees. Um, there's a lot of places where we need things to be comparable in order for us to make forward progress, and now we know how to do it, right? I, I just, I really like interfaces. Maybe, maybe I'm a little bit weird, um, but obviously I am a little bit weird, so that's, um, that's not up for question, right? All right, let me ask you a question. Why is compare to an interface, but equals is part of object? So because equals is part of object, every object has to implement equals. If you don't, you get some other implementation, but there's no way to get out of it. You have equals. If you want to change how it works, you can do that by overriding it, but you can't get away from it. You've got it. In contrast, comparable is a choice. You don't have to implement comparable. Why? Yeah, over on the right. My, my right. So, so yeah, so the, 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 the um, it's a good answer. Shorter version of that is that not every Java object is comparable, but Java decided that every object must have some notion of equality. So at minimum, this is the default implementation you get of dot equals. At minimum, a Java object is equal to itself by default. If you don't do anything with equals, any instance of your object will be equal to itself. 
It won't be equal to anything else, but it will be equal to itself. And that sort of makes sense. If you're not equal to yourself, then there's some deep epistemological problem that we've just created, right? That, like, the philosophy department's going to have to work on. Um, that makes sense, right? Objects are equal to themselves, at least. Now, you can broaden the definition of equality by implementing equals and saying, for example, two people with the same first, last name, and age are equal. That doesn't sound like a fantastic way to do it. But maybe two person objects with the same social security number are equal. That's OK, kind of, um, et cetera. Right? So you can broaden the definition of equality, but we have a starting point, which is that two, an instance of an object is always equal to itself. And it really always should be equal to itself. We pointed out that if you're kind of a joker, you can, imp you can override equals and have it return false, meaning that you will never be equal to anything else. I think at that point, actually, a bunch of things will stop working that you would like to work. In contrast, not every Java object supports a meaningful idea of a comparison, right? Um, you can think of some objects that are naturally comparable. Strings, we have an agreement about how to compare strings. It's an order that's established by society. It's not some deep thing that was sent to us on a tablet from outer space. Um, it's just something we decided. A goes before B in the English language, so when I find a dictionary, the A's are in the front, the B's are afterwards. Z is at the end. It's just a convention. But not every object that we're going to model in Java has that idea, right? Um, so you can think of, you know, objects that are comparable. Numbers are comparable to other numbers. Strings we compare using lexicographic order. Two pets, comparable. One thing I want to uh, uh, sort of warn you about here, right? Because you might think, well, I can think of lots of ways to compare two pets. Just put them in order by height, right? That's what they do at the dog show or something, right? Um, it has to be a meaningful order of compare. Like, the, usually you can find some way to put things in order, but if that's not a well-recognized idea of what it means to put two things in order, then you're in trouble, right? So again, I could, I as long as my class has a numeric field, I can always order it by that field, but it doesn't necessarily make sense, right? If I sort a list of pets, do I expect the ones in front to be the youngest or the thinnest? or the shortest, or the ones whose breeds have been around for the longest? I don't know. There's no, we don't have an agreement about this. So, so I would probably not bother. Okay. Well, I, I'm gonna skip this example so we can do this. All right. So I'm breaking one of my usual rules, which is that we're gonna look at at least uh, today's homework problem. You're welcome. Um, partly because you guys have a quiz coming up and I want you to see how to do this. All right, so here's, before we did the provider part of comparable. We implemented comparable. Now we're going to do the user part. Everybody's like perking up. They're like, oh, wait. You know, <laughs> free work. Um, I'm not sure we'll get through the whole thing, but I'll at least get you started. Um, all right, so here is the idea. We provided comparable. That's one side of the interface. Now we're going to use it. You do not have to implement compare to as part of this problem. That's not what it's asking. I know that's confusing because we're starting with interface. That's okay. But you don't, solving this problem does not require that you implement compare to. You will have to com call compare to, but you do not have to implement it. We're gonna rely on existing implementations of compare to in order to solve this problem. All right, so what the problem asks you to do is create a class called minimum that has one static method called min that takes an array of objects that are comparable. And it finds the minimum value of those objects, okay? So, and there's a reminder about how comparable works. Oh, there's supposed to be. Where did that go? Did I do this twice? Oh, no, here it is. So, first dot compare to second words returns a positive value if first is larger than second, a negative value if first is smaller than second, and zero if they're the same. So, what I'm, I'm, given that I'm implementing the minimum, what I want to hone in on here is this part about the negative value. So a negative value at first is smaller than second, although I can use either, either one of those. Okay. So here's, here's some starter code, where I've just fleshed out the class name and the method signature. And I've called it a couple times, just so you guys can see what happens. What's an interesting thing that's going on here? something that we haven't quite seen before, but I want you guys to think about. 
it's sort of, I mean, this works, and it's kind of nice it works, but there's something strange happening here that we haven't seen before. Yeah. What's that? Well, I'm, what, am I, what am I passing to my min function on line eight? An array of strings. What am I passing on line nine? An array of this capital integer thing, which we haven't talked about before, but you guys can sort of guess what this does. This is an object in Java that stores an integer. It's useful in cases like this. What is the, um, what's the type of the array that min is supposed to expect to receive as a parameter? Comparable. So what's happening here? I'm casting, now this is not an upcast, because this is an interface, not an object, but I'm casting, I'm able to cast an array of strings to an array of comparables. I'm also able to cast an array of integers to an array of comparables. Why? Why can I do this? What does this tell me about string and capital I integer? What do I know about them? Even though I haven't read their documentation, I haven't read their source code, I know something about them. They must both implement comparable. So if I try this, for example, and now let's say system.out.println minimum.min new pet, let's try to, to, to pass it an empty array of pets, uh, minimum.min, there we go, right? Yeah, so now it's complaining that there's no method that it can use for this, because pet does not implement comparable. And I'm not gonna even, I'm not gonna bother with doing this, um, but let's just, let's just move forward. So, what I want you to think about here, I'm gonna show you how to solve this. Let's pretend that instead of an array of comparables, I have an array of ints. So how would I solve the problem in that case? I would say int minimum, well first I would say, you know, if, if values is equal to null, I need to do something. I think I'm supposed to return null. If values.length is equal to zero, what do I do? Um, null or empty, I return null. So if I say if values is equal to null or values.length is equal to zero, okay. So I've handled my corner case here. Now I'm gonna say int minimum, because I know it has at least one element. I'm gonna say for int i is equal to one, i is less than values dot length, i plus plus, say if values i is less than minimum, I set values, I set minimum equal to values i. And then I return my minimum value. Okay, so this is how to compute the minimum if I had ints, but I don't have ints. So what changes do I need to make here? This, I mean, this is the solution. Now we just have to, to, to fix it. What's the first change I need to make? Yeah. Minimum has to be a comparable object. I'm not dealing with ints here. So that works. So the, the way that we do this is we say, if the array is null or empty, return null. Otherwise, I initially set my minimum to be the first element of the array, and then I go through all the other elements and compare them. Okay, now what do I need to do? I'm really close. Yeah. Where? Yeah, so in Java, I can't do this unless I have a number. But I can do this. I'm gonna leave this for you to finish. You're very close. That's it. Other than that, it works. If it's smaller, I reset my minimum. When I'm done, I return the minimum. All right, great. So my office hours today will not be held. I have to leave a little bit early today. Remind you, you have a quiz starting on Sunday about interfaces. You guys are ready for that, good luck. Um, please get started on MP3. I will see you all on Monday. Have a fantastic weekend.